this, let's turn to Luke chapter 11. Now, we're going to go from here to the book of Acts, but we're going to start in the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 11. We started a series a few weeks ago um, called Snapshots of the Early Church. And the, the idea here is we're doing something of an overview of the book of Acts, and we're not necessarily going chronologically, and we're not going verse by verse, but what we're doing is we're looking into the book of Acts to get an idea of what certain things looked like in the life of the early church. And this morning, we're going to talk about the prayers of the early church. And really, it's more accurate to say we're going to be talking about the prayers of the early church because one of the things that we will see in the life of the early church is these were a people who were committed to the activity of prayer at, at, at every important juncture of the church every turning point every development you see the people there involved in praying what's interesting to me is that in luke's gospel chapter 11 at the very beginning of the chapter you see an interesting conversation. We read here in verse 1, it came to pass as he was praying. Now, this is Jesus that we're talking about. As Jesus was praying in a certain place when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, what's interesting about this is that if you look in the original language, the tense of their question is literally this, Lord, teach us to be praying. They're not saying, teach us how to do it. They're saying, make us people who do it. And in my own Christian life and in my years involved in church ministry, I would say that probably resonates for most of us. We already know what prayer is. We don't need more Bible studies on prayer or books on prayer or conferences on prayer. What we need to do is we need to do it. We need to be people who pray. And again, what's interesting about this exchange is that their question of, Lord, teach us to be praying, comes right on the heels of them observing him praying. Now, we might make the argument that of anyone who ever walked the earth, the one person who might not have, quote unquote, needed to pray was Jesus as the Son of God. And yet he himself, we often see him rising early going out into the wilderness to be alone or passing the whole night in prayer. And if Jesus himself spent time praying, seeking the will of the Father, how much more should we be people of prayer? We already know what it is. Hey, it's as simple as having a conversation. We're having a conversation with God. We're communicating with God. We might say we're communing with God. We're just chatting with the Father. You know, as we raise our children, and I've always said that we're not raising children, we're raising adults. When, we, when it comes to prayer, we just try to help them understand that, look, whatever is on your mind right now, that's what you talk to Jesus about. It's not this, I'm having a conversation with my friends and I'm going about life's activity and then all of a sudden, let's pray. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. You know, and it suddenly becomes this. It's just, Lord, I'm in the middle of my day. And oh, by the way, Father, let me just tell you this. God, I've been thinking about that. Lord, this frightens me. Lord, this concerns me. God, Dad, Father, can I talk to you about this? I think what God desires ultimately is for us to be completely honest and completely transparent with Him. That's why I love the Psalms. The Psalms is not this set of pre-packaged prayers. It's just the honesty of the writers crying out, Lord, how long? Why do the wicked prosper? How long are you going to wait, God, before you do something? That's just honesty. I don't think the Lord ever gets annoyed with us talking with him or communicating our heart to him. Lord, teach us to be people who do it. Teach us to be people who pray. So let's do this. Let's springboard from Luke chapter 11. Let's come to Acts chapter 1. Because what I want to do real quickly, ha, if I can do that, 
is kind of skim through some sections in the book of Acts where you see that if indeed the apostles' hearts had been, Lord, make us people who do it, then in the early church we see that they caught it, man, because they were doing it. Now, you'll remember when we started this series, Snapshots of the Early Church, the very first thing we talked about was the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the early church. In Acts chapter 1, this is in that time frame when Jesus, he's been resurrected, but he's not yet ascended into heaven. It's about 40 days that he's with his disciples, and he's teaching them certain things. We'll pick it up there in verse 4. It says, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me, because John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Look in uh, verse 8, he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus says to them, look, the first thing I want you to do is wait. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit, because when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses here in your hometown and the surrounding vicinities and to the end of the earth. Now, look what happens in verse nine. It says, when they had spoke, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in the like manner as you saw him go. Then they returned, verse 12 says, to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room. Look in verse 14. And these all continued with one accord in prayer. So Jesus is with them, and he's still teaching them things about the kingdom, and then he's ascended from them into heaven. But before he goes, the first thing he tells them to do is wait in Jerusalem. And of course he goes, the two angels are like, uh, what are you looking at, right? Go do what he told you to do. So they go back to Jerusalem, they go into an upper room, and there they pray. They pray, Lord, teach us to be people who do this. And they did. They were. It's always amazing to me when we talk about the early church so often, we throw out the idea of the early church. And, and, and for many of us, the first thing that our mind or our heart gravitates towards is the day of Pentecost. Yeah, that day when they were gathered together in the upper room and there was a great sound like a mighty rushing wind and they all began to speak with other tongues and Peter preaches this th sermon and three thousand people get saved the early church <laughs> the very first thing that we see the early church doing is praying before the day of pentecost what preceded the day of pentecost was prayer and I think so often we want the Pentecost-like type things. Dude, we want to see the Spirit poured out. We want to see somebody stand up and teach one Bible study and 3,000 people get saved. Lord, let me see that. I want to be part of that. Well, then do what they were doing before that, which is be committed to prayer. Dr. A.T. Pearson said this, there has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. Let me read that again. There has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. When you look down through church history, any great revival that you see, it always started with this prayer. It always started with a group of people who were committed to the singular activity of prayer. Even a small group of people, a handful of people. You go back and you research some of the revivals down throughout church history, you find at the very beginning of them, there was four or five people meeting over a 
sustained period of time just praying. Meanwhile, we say we want to see the day of Pentecost. Then we schedule our prayer meetings and very few people come out. Now, when a day of Pentecost thing happens, we flock to it. Because, yeah, that's what I want to see. But just the simple action of praying, waiting on the Father, seeking his heart, being available, communing with him in prayer. What's interesting to me is that this is the first thing the church was doing before the day of Pentecost, but then after the day of Pentecost, it's also what they continued in. Look in Acts chapter 2, if you would. Now, this is after what I was just talking about. Peter stands up, teaches one sermon, 3,000 people get saved. After that, what did the church do? I mean, did they start up the Peter traveling evangelistic bus ministry? No, 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 no. Here's what it says of the early church. Verse 40 of chapter 2, it says, With many other words, he, that's Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added. And watch this, Acts 2.42. To me, this right here should be the calendar of the church. This is what, when you look at what we are doing, or any church really, these are the elements that you should see embodied within the activity of a church. They continued steadfastly. And by the way, that term continued steadfastly, it literally means they never got tired of. They never got tired of teaching, fellowship, communion, and prayer. That's it. There were no big concerts. There were no scheduled evangelistic crusades. There was no Bible college. There was no missions agency. There was no homeless outreach. It was a group of people who fell in love with Jesus. And here's what they never got tired of. Teaching. They never got tired of listening to the apostles relate the truths of God's word. So often, you look at churches today, and, and the calendar is peppered with all these different activities, but the one thing that will we'll seem to skimp on first is, well, you know, don't have a big, long Bible study. If there's, if there's anything we can trim off this active calendar that we have, let's knock out some of the teaching. We don't need quite that much teaching. Hey, the early church never got tired of teaching. They never got tired of fellowship. I'm amazed at how we live in, in the day that we live in. And we want community, but we want no commitment. It's like, I want to know people and be involved in their lives via my phone. You know what I mean? Like, I want to know people and be connected to them. I just never want to leave the comfort of my house and my schedule to go be with people. We'll talk more about this next week. Communion, but praying. They never got tired of praying. That is what the church continued in. If we look at what we're going to do, these are the four things that I can tell you. If you're here this morning and you're going, gosh, you know what? I've been visiting, but I'm not quite sure what the church is all about. Or maybe you have been coming for a while and you're wondering, Kevin's still kind of relatively new. I wonder where this whole thing's going to go. Here's the four things that I can tell you we will not stop doing. We won't stop teaching. We won't stop providing opportunity for fellowship. We will continue to observe the Lord's Supper or communion, and we will be committed to prayer. That's it. We might get rid of everything else. But those are the four things that we're going to have. Because you know what? Out of that bedrock, so to speak, everything else in the early church came. We talked about this months ago, how we were going to establish the trunk. For all intents and purposes, this verse right here is the trunk of the early church. And then everything else grew out of that. So often today we can say we want to have this ministry and this ministry and this ministry and this ministry. And we want 15 different ministries, but we sacrifice the health of the trunk. Let's establish the trunk and ministry will start to blossom. They never got tired of it. Now let your eye drop down to chapter 3. Because this is interesting as well to me. 
Verse 1 of chapter 3 says, When Peter and John went up together to the temple, note this, at the hour of prayer. So these guys are on a pathway to prayer, right? They're on their way to a prayer meeting, and watch what happens. A certain man lame from his mother's, mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. If you know the rest of the story, the guy receives strength in his legs. He rises up. He begins to leap around and praise God. And everybody knows who this guy was. My point is, though, if Peter and John weren't on their way to a prayer meeting, I wonder if this would have happened. Because, see, when you set your life on a path toward prayer... You're going to be a person committed to it. You're going to see God begin to open up opportunities before you. Now, what's interesting to me again is that as the result of this, I mean, Peter, like, I just wonder sometimes what it must have been like to be Peter, right? I mean, Peter just preached this sermon on the day of Pentecost, and I don't think he had prepared for it. You know, I don't think on the day of Pentecost, you know, the Holy, okay, it's 950, the Holy Spirit's about to be poured out, and everybody's speaking in tongues, and Peter stands up with his iPad, and he says, my study this morning, he just stands up and he starts to expound in the moment. And 3,000 people, I, I, I bet you nobody went away from that more stupefied than Peter. <laughs> and now this guy's on his way to his prayer meeting. Here he is with him, his buddy John, and they see this guy lame. And he's asking for money. And you know, we, we think sometimes that this stuff just must have, oh, they must have just known. But I wonder if Peter was just engaged in this conversation having no idea what was about to happen. Where he says, look at me. I don't have any money, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And you ever wonder if Peter's thinking in the back of his mind, but what if he doesn't? <laughs> you know what I mean? I think sometimes, like, we forget about, that the scripture teaches us about the gift of faith. I think the Lord met Peter in this moment and gave him the faith to speak these words. And then, as the result of this, he preaches again, and the number jumps up to 5,000. I wonder if Peter is just kind of walking around going, what's happening? But they get arrested. Peter and John, they get brought before the religious leaders, the same people who had Jesus arrested and crucified. And they threaten them. They say, if you don't stop doing this, for all, I'm paraphrasing, we're going to kill you too. Peter basically says, well, do what you got to do. Look what happens in chapter 4. Look in verse 23. Being let go, that's what just happened. They were arrested. They were brought before the authorities. As the result of this on the way to the prayer meeting, healing someone that the whole community knew, now the believers in Jerusalem are 5,000 people. They're arrested. They're threatened. Now they're let go. Watch what happens. They went to their own companions, verse 23, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Look ahead over there in verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, verse 31, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Don't you love this? A guy is healed, the community gets saved, they're arrested and they're threatened, and they don't go back and have, we say, well, you know, we better have a meeting to decide what we're going to do. They go back and they have a prayer meeting and they say, God, give us the boldness to keep speaking your name. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they, be, they pray for boldness. But this boldness comes through prayer. The first activity of the church, prayer. The day of Pentecost preceded by, by prayer, followed by never getting tired of prayer. Now in the face of threats, praying. Look in chapter 6 of the book of Acts. 
We talked about this um, a few months ago when we were selecting the deacons of the church. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1, this problem arises in the church, which, by the way, is important for us to see because don't think of the early church as kind of this utopian society where they never had any difficulties. They did. In those days, verse 1 of chapter 6, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we, verse 4, will give ourselves continually to prayer. And if you look in verse 5, it says, The saying pleased the whole multitude. So, Follow what's happening here. This practical problem comes up. There's a group of people who are being overlooked in the daily distribution of goods. The apostles, their heart is, we know this need needs to be met, but we can't get pulled off of our focus, which is the word of God and prayer. And listen, everybody agreed with them. Everybody understood, you're right. You don't need to be pulled off focus from teaching the word of God and giving ourselves to prayer. And so this is where the first deacons comes through. But you can see their, their priority on prayer. We will give ourselves continually to prayer because they never got tired of it. They sought the Lord in everything. If you look ahead over into chapter 8, this is when what Jesus said would happen in Acts chapter 1, actually happens. By the way, this is interesting and probably something we'll talk about in a future study. It's interesting that Jesus, in Acts chapter 1, says to his church, says to the disciples, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, you'll receive power, and you'll be my witnesses. And he mentions Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. By Acts chapter 8, you know what they had done? They had stayed in Jerusalem. And this was several years, by the way. It's, it's, it's an interesting picture to me of how when God begins to work somewhere that we kind of want to just stay there, you know, and focus on that thing. I, I think about Peter up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember when Jesus kind of zips off the skin and reveals himself in all of his glory and there's Moses and Elijah and Peter comes out with that amazing declaration it is good to be here you know captain obvious right but you remember what he says he said lord let's let's build three tabernacles here let's just hang out up here on the mountaintop and i love it because god speaks from heaven peter shut up that's a, again that's a trans you know transliteration but i mean it's like that's essentially what god says says, Peter, this is my son. You need to listen to him. Stop talking. But what's interesting is that Jesus said, you're going to receive power, and then you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. They stayed in Jerusalem. I mean, there's 5,000. It was a mega church. 5,000 people. This is awesome. You go into the service in Jerusalem? I'm going, man. You know how God nudged them out into Judea and Samaria? Persecution. What's interesting to me is that we kind of have this mentality that when persecution comes, it's an attack of the enemy. I think God allows persecution sometimes to get us to be obedient. Because you know what? Sometimes we don't do what God tells us to do until there's the buffeting. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I better do what God said. And this persecution arises and the believers immediately spread to Samaria. And this guy named Philip becomes an evangelist. He goes down to Samaria. Verse 4 tells us, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Because unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now jump down to verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, 
they sent Peter and John down to them, who, when they came down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because as yet he had fallen upon none of them. What's interesting to me is you have in Acts chapter 6, a group of leaders, a group of apostles saying, we don't want to get pulled off the focus of our priority being praying continually. But then you see that in action in Acts chapter 8, because this revival breaks out and two of them come down. I mean, they, they take time out of what was probably a busy schedule to come down and pray for that group. Don't think it weird if your church leaders or if church leaders in general ever seek to pray for you. You know, don't let that sort of like wig you out, you know, like that there's some kind of superiority complex. Like I put my pants on, pants on one leg at a time, just like they do. Well, of course you do. But it's something that God's called church leadership to is to pray. In fact, to give ourselves to prayer. And you see it, again, beautifully demonstrated in Acts chapter 8. Now, come ahead with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 10. <clears throat> there are some critical junctures in the life of the early church. Now, again, some of this is kind of a flash forward to things we'll talk about in future studies. But remember that in the early church, the group of people that this work started with primarily was Jewish. If you had gone to any one of those early gatherings of the church in the early chapters of the book of Acts, it would have primarily been Jewish people. And so when you see the gospel starting to come to people who were not Jewish, it was actually a really big deal. There were actually many conversations, heated debates over whether or not the gospel was for anybody other than Jewish people. And chapter 10 sets up one of those conversations for us. Chapter 10, here's what we see. There's a fellow by the name of Cornelius in verse 1. He's a centurion. And he becomes interested in hearing the word of God. Okay, so he sends a delegation to find somebody to bring him the word of God. Now look in verse 9 of chapter 10. It says, The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter goes up onto the housetop to pray. Okay, so it's the middle of the day. It's about lunchtime. Peter goes up onto the roof. It was the cool part of the house. He goes up there to pray. And while he's there, he kind of has, he kind of falls into almost like a trance. It says he became very hungry, verse 10. He wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and he saw heaven opened and an object like, object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. And in it are all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times. Okay? So Peter goes up onto the rooftop to pray. And God shares with Peter this object lesson. Okay? Because remember the Jewish mindset. That the gospel was just for the Jewish people. And God shows him this sheet filled with unclean animals. And God tells him, kill and eat. You're hungry. He says, no, no. Not so, Lord. God says, what I have made, you shouldn't call unclean. Happens three times. And all of a sudden, verse 17, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision he had seen meant, the men who had been sent from Cornelius' house made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose name was Peter, was lodging there. And Peter thought about the vision. The Spirit said to him, there are three men seeking you. Go down and go with them, doubting nothing, because I have sent them. To make a long story short, Peter goes with them, preaches this Bible study to a Gentile named Cornelius, and his entire household gets saved. But where did that come from? It came from him being up on the rooftop praying, and God shows him this vision. And while he's praying over here, God's working on the other side of the equation here, 
So that the minute he has the vision here in prayer, he wakes up and he's like, I wonder what that was all about. Hey, are you Peter? Yeah, come with us. He goes with him and he comes in and they're all Gentiles. And he's like, I don't know what's going on. Because the gospel's for Jewish people. And he preaches and they all get saved. And he goes away and he goes, I guess the gospel isn't just for Jewish people. And then he gets brought before the leadership of the early church. I mean, you read the ensuing chapter, chapter 11. I mean, he is there relating the story because they're, they're basically saying to him, how did you go into a Gentile's house and eat? He's like, can I just tell you what happened? I was up on the roof and this thing that looked like a sheet came down. It had all these animals in it and I'm hungry and God says, eat them. And I'm like, no, I'm Jewish. And God says three times, no, I want you to eat because what I have made it, don't call it unclean. And then all of a sudden, and I go and they're Gentiles and I preach and they get saved. They spit, I mean, I, and they're like, I guess the gospel's for the Gentiles. It would be like us, the way we paint Muslims out to be the enemy, going to one of their houses and eating or a prostitute. Think of all the groups that we marginalize. And we say the gospel, hey, we're all saved, praise the Lord, but I don't know about that group over there. And it was this critical juncture in the life of the church where God revealed to them, this thing is so much bigger than any of you have been thinking. And it was born out of prayer. Now, in chapter 12, James and Peter are thrown in jail. And a guy by the name of James is killed. This is John's brother, by the way, not the brother of Jesus. Chapter 12, verse 1, it says, About that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to further seize Peter. And it was during the days of unleavened bread, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four, delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So you catch the scene here. Peter and John, or sorry, Peter and James have been arrested. James is immediately killed. And the when it says the Jews here, we're talking about the Pharisees, the non-believing Jews, the same people who killed Jesus. It pleases them, and so Herod's a politician. He's like, hmm, this might, you know, sort of increase my votership, so I'm going to do the same thing with Peter. Puts Peter in prison, waits for the right moment. Here's what it says in verse 5. Peter was there for kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. That thing that they were doing before the day of Pentecost, that after Pentecost they never got tired of, that the leadership had a commitment to, that they demonstrated, that opened up the door for them to understand the gospel was so much bigger. Now, in the face of, I mean, let's face it, it's one thing to see your leadership threatened in Acts chapter 4 and strictly warned not to preach anymore in the, in, in the name of Jesus. It's one thing to go back after that and have a prayer meeting and, and say, Lord, just give us the boldness to keep going. It's another thing to watch one of your leaders be executed and another one of your leaders be thrown in jail and say, what are we going to do? Oh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have a prayer meeting. In fact, we're going to offer constant prayer to the point, listen, to the point that if you know the story, Peter is in prison and he gets woken up in the middle of the night by an angel and the angel leads him out of prison. He gets free and he goes to the house where they're having the prayer meeting. And it says in verse 13 of chapter 12, as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she didn't open the gate. She ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. You see this? He's in jail. They all know he's waiting to be killed and they're having a prayer meeting. And the next thing you know, there's a knock at the door and you go, who is it? It's Peter. Hey, Peter, the We've been constant prayer. He's here. Sometimes I wonder if we expect our prayers to be answered. Seriously. 
Sometimes, you know, when we read in the Bible about the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Effective, fervent, fervent, fiery, hot prayer. That's the idea. Constant prayer. I wonder if prayer becomes so rote for us sometimes that if we were praying for somebody to be set free from prison, if they knocked at the door, we wouldn't even expect them to be there. Constant prayer and an angel. I mean, God, God does something supernatural. An angel wakes up Peter in the middle of the night and leads him out of there. Down in chapter 13, you see that the early church or the leadership of the church in Antioch they're gathered together and they're ministering to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit speaks to them and he says, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. So the first missionary journeying is born out of prayer. Deliverance, boldness, missionaries, evangelism, the Holy Spirit, power, wisdom, guidance. These were a people who when they said, Teach us to be praying. Like Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, pray without ceasing. I mean, these are people who on the rooftop or in prison, individually or corporately, in times of flourishing or in times of persecution, they were praying. Praying people. Philippians says, in everything through prayer and supplication. Just look. Where do we fall in our prayer life? Has, has prayer kind of been or become this stale ritual that I know I'm supposed to do, and I kind of just check the box, or has it remained what God always intended it to be, which I'm sure that it was, when those disciples saw it in Jesus, an active, ongoing, organic, vibrant connection with the Creator God, who only has your best interests at heart, and can reveal things to you that you couldn't possibly know about otherwise. Seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. I'll never forget years ago, man. <clears throat> I, I had a place I used to go to pray. This place called Stone Mountain aptly named because it was just a big mountain of stone. It's like the world's largest exposed piece of granite. And it's got a carving on the front of it. It was done by the same guy who did Mount Rushmore. And so if you grew up sort of in the shadow of Stone Mountain and then you ever went to see Mount Rushmore, you were kind of like, really, that's it? Because Stone Mountain's like really huge. This carving's amazing. And um, I used to go out there to pray all the time. Great spots to kind of get alone and to seek the Lord and I always go out there around dusk and I'd have my Bible with me. And there was one time when I was kind of down in this place where I was praying and just kind of, oh, you know, spending time with the Lord. And, uh, and I heard something over in the bushes, you know. And I was like, oh, what's that? You know. And I look and this rabbit came out. I like rabbits. I do. I had one for nine years. Cadbury was her name. A little white rabbit just like Cadbury Bunny. Moved with me from Georgia to Texas, back to Georgia. Just had this, wrote a, wrote a book about her, all this kinds of stuff. I know, weird. But <laughs> I'm, I'm there and I'm, I'm in this moment of prayer and seeking the Lord. And it's like, oh, oh, there's this prayer. There's this, there's this prayer. There's this rabbit. You know, it just appeared. And I'm like, oh, Lord at that it's a rabbit and I suddenly become very still I'm like Jesus do you see this and he's like yes and I wish you would be more focused on seeking me than you are on that rabbit <laughs> and I was like yeah 
And sometimes I think that's what happens, man. Satan just kind of throws, he gets us going down rabbit trails, you know. When God wants us still, I mean, I love the verse that he says, I will reveal to you secret things which you do not know. You ever had one of those moments of prayer where you're just like seeking the Lord for like divine wisdom and you're like, how is this all going to, and in the middle of prayer, the Lord just illuminates you and you're like, ah, 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 praise the Lord. Healing, wisdom, direction, a word of knowledge for someone, power, boldness, prayer. We don't need to know what it is. We already know what it is. We just need to be doing it. Make us people of prayer. Lord, I pray that we'll take a lesson this morning from the early church. And I pray, I pray, Lord, for me, Lord, not to please you and not to earn points, but to enter into a deeper intimacy with you. Make me a, a father, a husband, a pastor of prayer. Lord, make us a body of praying people. Lord, you know, we may look around our church, we may not have a lot of resources, but we have the most powerful resource ever, and it's praying to you. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us recognize that while we may not have what seems like much through prayer, you can do anything. Lord, I ask that we would just become people committed to it. I pray that you would deepen our understanding of it. May this, to, today, may this simply be scratching the surface. May you now take us deeper as we meditate upon these things throughout the day and throughout this week, Lord. We love you. You're awesome. We thank you that you've even created a way that we can communicate with you. You could, you could have put everything in motion, taken your hand off of it, and just sort of escaped into the cosmos, but you've invited us to draw near and to commune with you. Father, receive our heart this morning. We bless your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. Amen.